Welcome back to iGen Politics. This is a podcast that makes politics engaging and relevant for all generations. This is Victor Shi. And I'm his co-host, Jill Weinbanks. I'm also the person who wears hashtag Jill's pins. And today's pin is an open book because our guest, Heather Cox Richardson, has just written a wonderful new book, which I'm going to hold up. It's Great book, Democracy yes. Awakening, Notes on the State of America. And so that's why I'm wearing a book pin. It's a great book that we're going to talk about a lot today. Um, We are doomed to repeat history unless we know and learn from it more than ever before. It seems like our country is repeating the darkest parts of our history by making the same mistakes. That's why it's so important for people not only to learn from our history, but actively work together to right the wrongs of our past and never repeat them again. And today, like Joel said, we are lucky to have on one of the leading historians, Cox Richardson. And we've talked about Heather's amazing newsletter. She writes letters from an American every night or almost every night. It's a Substack um, a publication and it is Substack's most subscribed newsletter. So she's been a guest before, but we find her fascinating and are thrilled to have her back. We're not only going to talk about why history matters uh, more than ever now, but we're also going to t- be talking about her brand new book, Democracy Awakening, Notes on the State of America. We are thrilled, Heather, to have you with us today. Thank you for being here. Oh, it's such a pleasure to be here. So we want to start uh, by talking about something that you you wrote last week that sent both um, Jill and me chills down our spines. You wrote about the state of our country and how, quote, none of what we're now would fly in America if the Senate controlled by Majority Leader Mitch McConnell of Kentucky were not aiding and abetting him. Talk about the moment that we find ourselves in right now with the state of the Republican Party. Well, so that's a really interesting quotation because that actually came from the very first official letter from an American I wrote back in September of 2019. Mm-hmm. I was quoting that in that piece you're talking about. And I, I the reason I wrote about it is it was the four year anniversary and I looked back and I thought, wow, that was really prescient because people focused on Trump as being the instigator of the the decimation of the Republican Party. And the truth was, all that way back there, you could see that it was really because he was able to do the things he did because McConnell was aiding and abetting him. So the that that destruction of the Republican Party, I think, has been underway for a long time, long before Trump. But it really took off in the Trump years when it was pretty clear that the party sold any pretense it had to defending the rule of law in favor of backing Trump, largely for his tax cuts at first, then perhaps because they wanted his voters, and finally at the end, perhaps because they were afraid of his voters, until we're at the point where we are now, where you know, there, there's place after place around the country now where Republicans are behaving in lawless ways and being defended by the party. So uh, before we go into more about the dissolution of the Republican Party, which I definitely want to get to, you mentioned something about being prescient. And so I have an early copy, the pre-publication copy that I'm holding up of your new book. And on page four, there is something that I thought was prescient. So let me just read it. Democracy is not safe if the people tolerate the growth of private power to a point where it becomes stronger than their dem- democratic state itself. That is its essence, is fascism, uh, ownership of government by an individual, by a group, or by any other controlling private power. To me, that screamed Elon Musk and Starlink. And obviously, you couldn't have known about Starlink when you were writing that. I'm I'm just saying the book came out too close to this revelation. But it really does cover that, doesn't it? Well, but better, that quotation is not me. That's from FDR. Yes, FDR that's true. Explaining to the, the American people in the 1930s, the difference in a government that is beholden to a very few very wealthy people, which is what he was standing against, and a government that that yeah. works for ordinary Americans. So one of the points about the book, but I think really a theme of American history, is the degree to which those two themes have been in conflict since the very beginning. Should the government answer to a few wealthy individuals, or should it try to 
uh, represent the interests of ordinary Americans. And it's not, I mean, it's it's easy to seem like you have inside information when you declare a principle like that and facts fall into those categories. But, you know, they're pretty much a universal pattern in our in our history. It was so fascinating to me. And of course, the word Democratic Party and Republican Party have had different meanings. Um, and the beginning of your book does go through a lot of the evolution of who the Democrats and who the Republicans were. But the Republican Party that all of us have known uh, as what it was, the GOP, has taken a, a real distinct turn since the evolution or the uh, coming onto the scene of Donald Trump. And um, so I'm just wondering if if we can look at, you know, what happened in Texas when um, the Senate did not convict Ken Paxton, if we can look at the non-impeachment of Donald Trump, if we can look at uh, the decision of, of Mitt Romney to not run for re-election, that the Republican-controlled House and Senate uh, and, and also, I guess we could look at Wisconsin, which is trying to impeach the newly elected justice before she even voted. Um, what does all of this tell us about where the Republican Party is today and whether there's it's not just federal level, but also at the state and local level? Um, so what's what's happened to the Republican Party and can there be a return to what Republicans stood for in the past? Well, that's a little question. So let me just answer it in two words. No, I'm kidding. But the um, okay. The, but the the issue with today's Republican Party really began in the the 1980s, if you will. Although the book traces it back to the 1930s. For our purposes today, the 1980s will work because what they have tried to do is to tear apart the New Deal government that became known as the liberal consensus when Republicans bought into that idea as well. And the issue with that, the idea of tearing apart a government that regulates business and provides a basic social safety net and promotes infrastructure and protects civil rights, is that those things are actually very popular among members of both parties. So when the Republicans under Reagan began to try and dismantle that government and replace it with one that, that was very small and trusted market forces to enable a very few wealthy men to uh, to ride the economy, if you will, in such a way that they would invest efficiently and provide jobs for people at the bottom. As they 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 pushed that project known as supply side economics, as they did that, their policies were not popular. I mean, people were on to the fact that their lives were not getting better, especially as the second set of Reagan tax cuts in 1986 took hold. So one of the things that happened then was that Republicans doubled down on two things. They doubled down on this idea of creating a fantasy world, if you will, a false reality for to argue to people that their version of reality was the one on which people should make political decisions. And that really takes off a little bit under Nixon, but Reagan is the one who really sets that in motion until we get to the point now where we have people like um, Tennessee Senator uh, um, uh, Marsha Blackburn, who is just, you know, inventing um her, he has a, a Twitter feed that simply is operating in nowhere near reality. So there was that, but there was also the problem that after 1986, they recognized in the Reagan administration that the tax cuts of that year were not popular and they wanted to make sure that they would stay in place. So the, uh, the other thing they did was to start to focus on ballot integrity, they called it, which was the idea that Democrats could only win if they cheated. So internal right. memos at the time said if they pushed the concept of ballot integrity, they hoped it would cut black people out of the vote. And that's the place we start to see the idea of arranging the, the, the mechanics of our political system to cut Democrats out of being able to vote freely and fairly. And that really takes off after the 1993 Democratic uh, Motor Voter Act, which really enables Republicans to say, oh, the Democrats are cheating by having these people who shouldn't otherwise vote be part of the, the voting population. So the problem with those two things, aside from any of the larger arguments about democracy, or um, or what that meant for policy is that it enabled Republicans to continue to push policies that were in fact not popular. Uh, 
And as they did so, wealth increasingly moved upward. We got away from the period between 1933 and 1981 in which wealth and, and income compressed, the period of great compression, as The Economist called it, and replaced it with what was known as the Great Divergence, in which people at the very top got rich indeed, and the, the rest of Americans, in fact, sort of fell out of the middle class and fell downward as the, as the middle class hollowed out. So coming out of that, what... What the Republicans created really beginning in the 1980s and taking off in the 90s and then in the aughts is the hollowing out of the middle class and the creation of a population that was really disaffected. You know, they didn't, they're, they're, they weren't as important in society anymore. They didn't have as much money. They were having to work extra jobs. They couldn't make ends meet. And at the same time, they were ripe, as scholars of authoritarianism would say, for a strong man to come in and say to them, hey, your real problem here is not our policies. Your problem is those guys. And who those guys were didn't really matter so much. But the Republicans really pushed that idea of, you know, your problem is not our policies. Your problem is those people. And those people for them were Black Americans and Brown Americans and women who worked outside the home and people who were not Christian. And, you know, they had a litany of those people who were in their terms, trying to destroy America and trying to create a government that in their minds brought socialism. That is the idea of government services that cost, that would take tax dollars to pay for them. So on that, rising up through that history, that 40 year history, we get the arrival of Donald Trump. And what Donald Trump did is he mirrored that population, that disaffected population. He's, he's a salesman. He saw yeah. what they wanted, and he gave it to them. And once he had them in his pocket, he melded them into a movement, into a movement that would follow him because he promised them, as authoritarians do, that if only the country would follow these divine laws or these universal laws that his opponents, the Democrats or, in, or any Republican who opposed him, were refusing to follow. And once they had internalized that, once it had become part of their identity, they were his to do what they wanted with. And so we flipped from this rising oligarchy to an authoritarian really astonishingly quickly. And of course, we saw sort of the, the pinnacle of that with the 2020 Republican convention when there was no policy platform at all. Is there anything that you think that the modern Republican Party stands for concretely policy wise? That's a great question. And, you, and you're right to call that out. That was an extraordinary moment that there was no, that, that's the whole point of a political party is to have a platform, right? And they just said, we're not going to have a platform this year. We're just going to do whatever he wants. That was just mind boggling. And then to hold it on all those spots that are so yes, central yeah. to the image of our democracy just blew me away as well. But you know, what does the modern day Republican party stand for? I mean, Biden called them out, President Biden, I'm sorry, called them him out called them out on this the other day, because at least Trump in 2016 promised a number of things that sounded good. He promised health care, he prom better health care, he promised infrastructure, he promised fair <laughs> tax laws. Now, you know, what I think they are promising is no policy, but revenge. And that and retribution, as Trump said, and that idea of being a party that has power to hurt seems to me to be what today's modern, today's Republican Party stands for. And that's not an American political party. That's really straight out of classic authoritarianism. So based on history, is there a chance that the old Republican Party that stood for smaller government and other things will break off from the Trump Party and form a viable alternative? So I would say yes, absolutely, but I would qualify that a little bit to remind people that the original Republican Party and the way it has been in its best incarnations under people like Theodore Roosevelt, for example, or Dwight Eisenhower, was not one necessarily of small government. It was one that was trying to protect liberal uh, individualism. And by that, they meant they were trying to protect individuals. And by the time of, uh, I'm sorry, and under Nick, under, um, under Lincoln, that meant that 
Lincoln and the Republican Party early on believed that the government should use its power to make it easier for yeah. individuals to work hard and rise. So we get the Homestead Act, we get public colleges, we get new kinds of money that enable people to do business across state lines. We get the Department of Agriculture so that people have government provided seeds if your father is not a planter, for example. And we of course get the income tax for the first time in our history. Theodore Roosevelt opens that up and says, wait a minute, because of the rise of large corporations, in order to protect individuals, you have to have a government that's large, not small, and a government that's big enough to make sure that corporations can't crush workers and can't crush individual Americans. And then, of course, Eisenhower takes that same concept and not only applies it domestically, but also tries to, uh, to apply those kinds of ideas to the international scene as well. So is that so so I'm that my caveat there is the Republican Party at its best does not stand for smaller government. Um, and I, we could talk about how it gets to do that. But the, your question was, will it ever rise again? And the answer that I always give to this is that for years, I have said the Republican Party was going to 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 self-correct because it did in the 1890s. It did in the you know the 1940s. And uh, certainly it was a very different party in the 1960s than it is now. But I have come to believe that this incarnation is going to burn itself up. It's going to it's going to immolate itself. And from that, we will get some political party, whether it's called Republican or not, that will embrace that idea that was the heart of the traditional Republican ideology, the idea that the government should invest in people just starting out. It should help with education. It should help uh people have access to resources so they can work hard and rise. They in turn will support somebody above them. They in turn will support people at the top who will hire people at the bottom because that image of society as a web is very different than the democratic idea of society really as the haves versus the have nots. And both of them are absolutely central <clears throat> to the way we understand America. Very interesting. So let's turn to talk about President Biden, because one of the things that Jill and I are most concerned about is the way that President Biden is getting covered by the media. And you have interviewed him one on one before in the White House. Um, I think it was was it more than a year? When was that? Was that beginning of his administration? Oh, yeah, it was February. You remember when you interviewed the president, it was February 25th, <laughs> 2022. Wow. So like, a year into his administration. And and so you kind of get a sense of who he is better than most people. First, give us, kind of talk to us about, about kind of what you saw in that interview. And why do you think the media isn't covering his accomplishments? And they're focusing so much about his age, not focusing, of course, uh, around Donald Trump's age as much. But how can we get to a place where the media covers Biden in the way that he's supposed to get covered? And what does that look like? So that's a really interesting question. I will say that having been one on one with him for close to an hour, which is much longer than it was supposed to be, I am gobsmacked when people say that he is mentally slipping. He is extraordinarily acute. He knows his stuff incredibly well. Um, not only the modern day material, but also the history, because I was, you know, I actually came prepared to talk quite a bit about his work on the Senate Foreign Affairs Committee, which was a while back. And I asked pretty broad questions. And man, he he didn't miss a trick on anything. I can't do hmm. that. I, I mean, I, I thought he was absolutely sharp in that, you know, I think if you live that stuff, it's 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 really on the on you know you're really into it and really able to come back with it. I think that the the other thing that has shocked me about this administration is how freaking much it's getting accomplished, both domestically yeah. and internationally. Yeah. So that brings up the next question: is why is that not getting coverage? And I have to say, I have started to wonder deeply about this myself because I always try to defend journalists. Their their worlds are difficult. But it's really clear if you read widely in the news that there's a, a, a much, a, very much a qualitative difference between the journalists who, for example, cover the State Department or the Department of Defense. They're very good. If you read the if you read the briefings and you, the the, Depart the Defense Department, for example, every day, man, the 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 journalists know it all. You know. What about the the cost overrun on the blah 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 that was supposed to be ready two and a half weeks ago? And you think this person knows what they're talking about? 
And then you turn to the coverage of the administration and there's some very, very good journalists out there. But the degree to which they sort of cover image rather than reality really shocks me. So today, for example, while we are recording this, there are a number of headlines about how Congress is in trouble. And I'm looking at that thinking, what are you talking about? The Democrats are absolutely lined up behind their leaders. They're voting on things. They're getting stuff done. The Senate has approved 12 appropriations bills or is in the process of doing so. They've come out of committee as, as we're recording. They haven't they haven't done them through the Senate yet, but there's no reason to think they won't. They've come out of committee with overwhelming votes. The Republicans, on the other hand, can't even agree on a proposal that they might, if they're lucky, be able to bring to a vote. And if they don't manage to do any of that, and right now it looks like they won't, the country's going to shut down. And you look at that and you say, the problem is Congress? You know, and, and I just, I, I just, I, I don't, I don't, I didn't even know how you get there saying that that's the problem. Yeah, there was an article today saying the problem isn't Congress. The problem is the Republicans in Congress. Yeah. 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 And, so, and so the, so for me, the whole, you know, people say it's about horse racing. Well, you know, maybe. And but maybe maybe it's that the newsrooms haven't been able to afford people with longer memories. Maybe it's that it takes an incredible amount of work to understand at least the foreign affairs side of stuff. I mean, yeah, I, I'm yeah. a little bit nonplussed yeah. because the story as it's as it is appearing in a lot of places, among other things, isn't very interesting. And you feel like, you know, like people can watch Lost and and figure out you know, what that stupid polar bear was. I'm sorry, that that interesting addition of that polar bear. Why do you <laughs> think they can't figure out the details of what's really going on in Congress? And I I, 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 I am stammering because I don't understand it. Well, that sort of leads to a, a, a related question, which is given that people aren't getting the information they need about what has been accomplished, could you put President Biden and his administration in our historic context and talk about how much he has accomplished and how he rates in a context of history? Sure. I, and I want to preface that by saying I was not a Biden supporter early on. And when he was elected, I thought, well, you know, at least he's going to be a placeholder that won't mm -hmm. do any harm for four years. And I was dead wrong. And I was dead wrong, first of all, in thinking that what would matter during his first term was not foreign affairs. And and I'll get to that in a second. But I was also wrong in not recognizing how extraordinarily important it is that he knows how to how to negotiate and how to make the system work. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at what that man got accomplished in the first two years of, of his administration, when he had a razor thin majority in Congress, we had the American Rescue Plan, which was the the reason that the United States recovered from the pandemic faster than any other um, advanced uh, nation. And he managed to get through, in addition to that, um, the, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, again, law, I'm sorry, now law, where think about the fact that Trump every week was infrastructure week, but right. getting that through <laughs> Congress took incredible negotiations. And, and you could see these guys going and, and women going home at night with their really big, thick books trying to negotiate this stuff. And then we had um, the, uh, the Chips and Science Act, which was huge, investing not only in the, the infrastructure we desperately needed to do here at home, but the Chips and Science Act brought back chip manufacturing to the United States and invested in science. And it did so on the same principles that FDR had invested in the United States in the 1930s, because it sort of primed the pump for private investment. And now there's been extraordinarily private investment in those fields as well. So tons of money is poured into the developing of a new economy for the 21st century private money as well as public money. And then of course we got on top of that, on top of all that, the inf in the Inflation Reduction Act. And the Inflation right. Reduction Act was fascinating on any number of levels, investing of course, hugely in climate science and changing, the, um, changing our approach to addressing climate change. Um, 
but also enabling the government, for example, to negotiate for drugs with uh, pharmaceutical companies, which is something, as I say, that every other advanced, and, and actually I think every other nation in some way caps drug prices one way or another, sometimes with a government cap. In this case, this is just giving the government the ability to negotiate with the pharmaceutical companies, something that was left out under the George W. Bush administration when it put through Medicare Part D. Um, those things were all just astonishing. I mean, that is an, it's a rejection of that old supply side economics that Reagan ushered in 1981 and replacing it with a vision that looks much more like FDR, but is forward looking, saying we got a climate crisis. Let's let's use that as an opportunity to increase manufacturing jobs, for example, which is exactly what has happened. Um, one of the things that always surprises me is I'm always a little nervous, like, what if I say good things and they turn out to be bad? And I'm like, well, wait a minute. We actually have proof this works, so I don't have to feel yeah. bad about that. And then, well, and then, it, 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 I was just going to say, I don't know why Americans can't learn from history. And if you looked at the economy as a, a guide, when has the economy done the best? When has the American population gotten the most benefits from government? It's been during Democratic administrations, but they seem to keep thinking trickle down economy will work. But there is no evidence ever that it has. So well, Bidenomics is. Bidenomics, yep. Well, you know, I don't think it's necessarily that they think trickle down will work. I think that people have bought into that story that they can right. do it on their own, which has never been real in the in the United yeah. States. But they they want to believe that it could be real. Um, and that that's a, a big problem um, because people vote on the image rather than the reality. But but the other piece, of course, about Biden is foreign affairs. And yeah. one of the things that literally keeps me up at night is imagine if Donald Trump had been in office when Vladimir Putin's Russia invaded Ukraine in February of 2022. Um they would have waltzed right in. I mean, the Ukrainians would have stood against them, but they would not have had the international support through sanctions and through um, munitions to fight back. And again, all power to the Ukrainians here, but the 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 NATO organization, uh, the uh, rebuilding through people like Biden and Secretary of State Antony Blinken, and the fact that there's now have now been additions to NATO has been huge in withstanding that. But so has the work that that the administration has done with so many other uh, partners around the world. And if you think about how that has played out, not only um, over the issue of Ukraine, but the idea that if Trump had been in office and Russia had moved forward as it had, if you as it would have. If you remember, that's actually such an interesting story, but if you remember right before that happened, Russia and China allied as, you know, really close partners, clearly with the expectation that their vision of government would spread around the globe. Now, by stopping there in Ukraine and by essentially bleeding Russia dry, as is happening right now in Ukraine and in the attempt to, to extricate some kind of victory from that defeat, or a seemingly coming defeat, China is also now tied to that. And China's got its own problems now. So in the space of two years, with the extraordinary help of partners and with Ukrainians, two of our largest geopolitical foes in 2020 have now been significantly weakened. And if you think about the degree to which the Biden administration has quite deliberately strengthened the presence of alternative visions in the Indo-Pacific by having things like that historic trilateral meeting with uh, the Republic of Korea, that is South Korea and Japan at Camp David in August of this year, and worked with the Pacific Island Forum and worked with um, the the different, with AUKUS and with different, and with SEEN and the different um, Indo-Pacific organizations that are developing their own economies and their own relationships aside from China, the world is an entirely different place than it was two and a half years ago. And and I, I again, I'm sort of gobsmacked that people looking at this moment say, oh, he's an old man who's washed up or, oh, he has my favorite. What has he done? I'm like, what hasn't he done? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I mean, it, it's like when he was in um, Asia the other week or in India for the G20 summit, and then you had all those headlines focusing on his age, but nothing that he actually accomplished. That was one of the most revolting 
aspects of that. But you also, if we can touch on, you also talk about Vice President Harris a lot. And when you talk about, you know, the Indo-Pacific China region and Asia region, she was there recently and she displayed extraordinary leadership, but she's also displayed, I think, really tremendous leadership here at home. And I remember reading one of your tweets about how you looked at all of her kind of speeches and transcripts and you said like as a historian, she gets overlooked so much. Can you talk a little bit about her and what people get wrong about Vice President Harris? I can, I will say vice presidents are always overlooked and they are always poorly treated because think about their job. Right. You know, until very recently, their job was was a sad one in that they were only gonna become really important if there was a tragedy. So we don't generally have a history of caring a great deal about our vice presidents. Now that has changed of recent years where um, vice presidents take on a much more active role in the administration. And she has been particularly interesting and I'm starting to see more attention paid to her. And I think that's really important for, for two reasons. First of all, the United States looks great around the globe when we can send uh, a woman with a heritage of a, a black history and parentage from India and somebody who's a woman. So her trip to Africa, which was about a year ago, I think, was a huge triumph. I mean, it was, a, and again, it barely got covered in the United States because the United States was sending a black woman to Ghana mm -hmm. and talking to people about democracy. It was an extraordinary moment. And she did something very similar recently in Indonesia, where of course she'd visited earlier and um, and been she'd been a number of times during this administration. Uh, she also has worked a lot in Latin America, of course. One of the things that jumps out to me about her is she's very, very, very smart, which again, is not necessarily a characteristic of vice presidents, just saying. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I used to watch her when she was in the Senate uh, just for fun, because you could watch her construct these extraordinary arguments. So I think, I think her role in that has been important in foreign affairs, I, which I think the administration has done quite deliberately because she didn't have that experience before and she needs to have it if she should ever, God forbid, have to step into the presidency. Um, but there is also the fact that I think, I think this truly people don't see. She has been traveling around the country talking to people about issues of race and equality before the law. That's been a really big theme and about reproductive rights. And that's been very important to bring populations to the Democratic Party and to make people feel that they're being heard. But Victor, this is your field, really. Um, I also think the thing that she brings is excitement from young people. Yeah. And one of the reasons it seems to me, and this could this is obviously just speculation, that she doesn't get a lot of press about that is because in a really weird way, and I can't believe I'm saying this to you, Victor, it feels a little bit like young people are being ignored in this totally. in this country right now, which is kind of bizarre when you think about the Dobbs decision and you think about uh, about gun safety regulations and you think about climate change. But those stories don't get anywhere near the coverage one would think they would from a young person's perspective. So when she's out there and people are screaming for her and there are lines down the streets and they're jumping up and down, I, I just don't think it necessarily registers with somebody who's writing a column about the vice president who is, you know, 65 years old. Well, it certainly isn't for lack of victors trying because he tweets repeatedly about the crowds that are attracted to both Biden and uh, Harris, uh, president and vice well, president. There's also, I mean, the, the polling is fascinating to me. I mean, you, you, like in the mainstream media, they'll, they'll just say, you know, approval, disapproval. But when you look at the crosstabs and the number of young people who support Kamala Harris, it's drastically higher than even the levels that they're supporting President Biden, but drastically lower than older generations too. And so I do think that that sort of tide of young people is an overlooked factor. I, the you know again I don't I don't focus exclusively at all on the younger generation but the, the young people I know simply love her they have nicknames for her and and you know somebody said to me once well you know she doesn't get along very well with other people and I thought or she, no she's not sociable or something and I thought honest to God I know young women who are not politically involved who talk about how much they love Mamala and and <laughs> you know I I I've just that does not sound to me like somebody who's unapproachable. 
No, absolutely not. And then I think, you know, when you mentioned the value that she brings abroad, she also, I think, brings that value to young people who are more diverse than ever before. And so I, I do think that she, you know, people ignore her at, or I guess people overlook Kamala Harris at their own peril. But let's move to your book. Um, your former book's all seem to focus solely on the past and history, but this one weaves the past and the current state of our country together amazingly well. Why take this different approach now? Um, Well, I I will answer that, but now I have to ask you, as a younger person, did this book speak to you or not? It did. And I actually, I I mean, I also recommended you, you sent me two, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say this, but you sent me two covers. And one of the covers that I enjoy was this cover. And Jill, I don't know if you have it to hold it up, but I I suggest it gave me a sort sort of optimism because it reminded me of sunrise and the the sun on the bottom coming up into the sky. And um, it really did resonate with me because I think it weaved that current and that past um, really, really well. It is a sunrise. Uh, and it was designed to be that. But I also kind of liked that it was also Ukraine, right? Yeah. Um, which was not, I mean, I wanted the sunrise, but um, why this book, why now? For a couple of reasons. It explains where we are, where here is, and how we get out of here, which feels very current. But it also makes an argument about the importance of understanding both language and history for recovering our democracy from the rise of authoritarianism. And so the part that the sunrise reflects is not the first section, which is how we got from the 1930s to the rise of Donald Trump, or the middle section, which is about the presidency of Donald Trump and how many ways it reflected an authoritarian government, which I still find horrifying. I can't make it through that second section without like thinking I'm not gonna read on anymore. But the third section is about our history and re-understanding our history in a, or reinterpreting our history in a way that utterly rejects the version that people like Florida Governor Ron DeSantis are trying to push. That is, they want a version of history that is rooted in the past, sort of, I used to say, sprung from the head of Zeus um, (laughs) or George Washington fully formed, uh, and, and that all of the world would be better, they think, if only we could go back to that magical moment, which is, in my version, an authoritarian history, the idea that we can get back to this idyllic past so long as we follow these laws that are universe, that are that have been laid down by a god or by nature. What I'm trying to argue is that our history is really not that. Our history is a democratic history, small d democratic history, in which from the beginning, people who have been excluded from positions of equality in society or of authority in our government have worked to make the principles of the Declaration of Independence come true. That is the idea that we all should be equal before the law and we have a right to have a say in our government. And the reason that the United States has managed to be a successful democracy is because those voices have always kept those principles front and center. And because of that, they have over time been able to expand the idea of who is included in that set of principles, set of democratic principles. So in this moment, when we're fighting over what history means and what the country means, That final section, which tries to reclaim a popular history and tries to give us a blueprint for expanding our our democracy yet again, seems like a really good thing to have out there right now. Heather, we weren't planning to ask you about the Equal Rights Amendment, but your comment about all are created equal, it's all men are created equal, and women are only in the Constitution because of the 19th Amendment, they get to vote but they don't have equal rights. So can you either put in historical context or just talk about how you feel about whether that has been passed because it has the right number of ratifications and what it would do for the country to have women fully incorporated in the constitution? Well, it is astonishing that they're not. I mean, let's just start <laughs> with that. It is it is simply astonishing that they're not. Um, and you're the lawyer here, not me. Uh, And every time I speak about this or say anything about it, people get very angry about it. There is, as you know, a fight about whether or not the ratifications that have taken place and that now that enough enough states have ratified it to make it um, 
to make it part of the Constitution. There's a fight over that because a number of states, since they ratified the amendment, have rescinded that ratification. And also the initial time limit that was put on that ratification mm -hmm. has run out. So I look at it and I'm not being a lawyer and I think, you know, part of me kind of wonders, why don't we just start again with it and run it through now? Because I think it would be now is the sort of moment where something would really be able to take off. But but I, I understand why people feel like it would be a legal fight to make the ratification happen because it will be challenged over those two things I said. But I also think it's it's bonkers that it's not in there. So it, it does feel like it's a moment that we we should fix. It is definitely bonkers that women are not fully included. Uh, maybe it's understandable in the 1700s why they weren't. But the fact that today they aren't is incredible. I can just briefly answer your two legal issues. And one is that the time limit that was placed on passage was not in the amendment, but was in a, a preamble that had nothing to do with what the states considered and voted on. So in my mind, the legal argument is much stronger that it does not bar its implementation. And there is a lot of legal history about the rescissions not being valid. Once you adopt, once you ratify, it cannot be rescinded. So I would take the position that it is actually ready for President Trump to say to the archivist, publish it and start enforcing it. That's what I would say. Um, Joe, Joe, but I Biden, not Trump. You want to say oh that again? God. Biden? Oh, my God. <laughs> That's what we Holy about. cow. Sorry. Did I actually say Trump? Yeah. Uh, let me repeat that again. Yes. Can I just start with that part? Yeah. So I would say that we're in a very strong position to say President Biden could say to the archivist, publish the amendment, make it part of our constitution, and tell his attorney general to start enforcing it. That's where I would be. I do like your idea of, well, would we start again? Well, we could, but look how many years have gone into this. And we now have really a, a divided country. And I would worry whether we would get 38 states to ratify today. Uh, the, the right-wing red states have become far more right-wing. And you know I'm old enough to remember the arguments that were made against it in the 70s. Women would be drafted. Women would have to pay alimony. Um, and yeah, that's all true. And it's already happened even without the ERA. Um, and nothing terrible has happened to our country. We haven't fallen apart because of it. And yet women are denied basic rights, including health care. So I think that there's plenty of reasons to have the Equal Rights Amendment. And if we had to start again, I just don't know in this world um, whether today it would pass. And think of the insult to women that we are no longer even, you know, that we're actively rejected, not just not passed. So I, I think we have to go with the argument that it has become law and should stay that way. Well, that's also a political question too, though, right? And I absolutely, I, yeah. I'm happy to defer to you on all that. I'm not a lawyer at all, but um, but the 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 political fallout for that right now is, and I'm not, I'm not, I don't have a position on this except that I think we should have one. Um, the timing matters, and how that timing is done matters in this moment. One more thing, actually, though. There is nothing in the Constitution, the, the word male does not appear in the Constitution right. until 1868 with the 14th Amendment, which is also kind of bizarre, if you think about it. Interesting. So let's focus on some of the um, more optimistic parts of your book. And, you know, you talk about um, reclaiming history and, um, you know, you reign, even though in the first kind of sections of the book, um, it's a little bit, you know, honest and brutal about our, where history has um, kind of gone. You do argue for reclaiming our history. Walk us through what that means and what that looks like now and who does that. So the idea of reclaiming our history is in the, in the way that I, I put it forward in this book is recognizing that our history is one in which ordinary people for the most part, although that could be 
ordinary people who become great like Abraham Lincoln, but ordinary people insist on being treated equally before the laws. And, and again, I keep saying this before the laws and having a right to say in their government, but how do they do that is the real question. So each piece of the final section of the book is set up to illustrate ways in which marginalized Americans have or colonials or uh, colonists originally have managed to use the tools at their disposal to demand equality and, and a government that reflects their interests. So, you know, we talk about the, the Declaration of Independence, the first chapter of the book, and they're all really short chapters. They were designed to be readable before bed. And there's 30 of them in the book. And the book is like 120, 250 pages or something. Yeah. Um, the, the first section is designed to talk about how you get a group of really diverse people to agree on something. And that what they agree on is an idea, and it's that idea of equality and a, and a government that reflects the people. And then, you know, I, there's another chapter that talks about the Constitution and how the Constitution was written and how it very quickly got tangled up in politics and how one of the great things that the framers of the Constitution did was they gave us the tools to, to change the Constitution, um, which is exactly what we were just talking about, Jill. So the, the final section of that book takes a look at all the different tools that we have and that people have used in the past to change the laws to include more and more people. Now, that being said, it is important to remember that I am an idealist. I believe that ideas change society. So the real theme of the, the final section is how do you get people to believe in democracy and how do you get people to believe that it is important oh. to expand democracy to include more people and so one of the major organizations that jumps out in that last section to me was the NAACP the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People which is formed in 1909 not really but they claim that date because they wanted it to mirror Lincoln's birth and that was an organization of Black Americans, journalists and sociologists, and Jewish Americans, uh, civil rights activists, and it was led in part by a man who was uh, the part of a family of enslavers in his his parents' generation, and they 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 figured out that in order to make the Fourteenth Amendment real, which was their goal, in order to make equality real, they had to publicize the atrocities that were being committed against Black Americans. So one of the great things that comes out of the NAACP is W.B. Du Bois, who is the sociologist who's just brilliant. And, you know, basically he can do anything he wants. What does he want to do? He says he wants to edit the crisis, which is their, their magazine. And there's a reason for that. It's because he recognizes that, that he has to get people's attention and make them understand the issues. And the NAACP, which again, when we think about the civil rights movement, we tend to focus on this, on people like Rosa Parks and the Montgomery bus boycott or, or the, the, um, the murder of Emmett Till, or, you know, some of the other really visible cases um, that, that people remember when they study that period. But those cases came out of the NAACP saying, we must publicize this. And so one of the things I think that jumps out in that last section of the book is the degree to which it's communities, it's organizations, it's people working together who change the status quo, who resist, who push back on laws that discriminate against them, rather than a few examples of very powerful, smart, able people who have tended to dominate our history when we think about those eras really for a long time now, but that really reinforce the idea that you can't do anything. It's only the those people at the very top who can change things. And part of what I was trying to do is say, those people at the top, they're great, but they're there because of ordinary Americans who paved the way for them. So Heather, maybe Two last questions. One is, what would you say the biggest threat to our democracy today is right now? And what gives you any hope that we can bring back democracy? And is there anything tangible for our audience to do other than vote, which I would say is the number one thing they have to do, because you're right. You, you say somewhere in the book that democracy isn't lost through violence in the streets, it's lost because people don't vote. So 
yes, our democracy is under threat. And what really terrifies me is the degree to which the MAGA Republicans, and remember, they're a very small minority. They are a very small minority of our population. Mm -hmm. And you can tell that by um, by the polls, for example, that talk about the popularity of gun safety legislation and of abortion rights and of addressing climate change and of, uh, you know, I could just make the list could keep on going. And when I say those things are popular, I'm not talking a little bit popular. They're very popular. So they're a very small percentage of the population, but they have managed to claim what I would call nodes of our government. That is the mechanics of our government through things like gerrymandering, through things like taking over the Republican Party in Republican dominated states like Texas, where we just had Attorney General Ken Paxton acquitted, um, even though a number of the Republican members of the Republican Party had voted to impeach him, that MAGA group of Republicans managed to acquit him, even though the evidence itself was pretty damning. So through things like gerrymandering, taking over the states, uh, threatening election officials, and of course, through the Supreme Court and through the different mechanisms of the Senate that enable people to stop, for example, the um, the, the promotions of military officials. Um, so I worry that they have taken over the mechanics of our government to the degree that it's going to be very hard for a majority to push back. That's what worries me. Because in a free and fair election, I have absolutely no doubt, even in a number of states that are currently Republican dominated, Texas would not be suppressing the vote as seriously as, as it is if it were not already a purple state. Florida, the same. If you look at the numbers of polling yep. in Florida, same there. Georgia, you know, those are all states that if we didn't have voter suppression and we didn't have gerrymandering, and we didn't have some of the other mechanical stuff we have going on that would at least be in play for the Democrats, if not be Democratic states. So that worries me a lot. Now, now, what gives me hope? Two things. One, we've been in similar situations before in which it looked as if there was an entrenched minority that was going to dominate society forever. And I'm not even going to take you all the way back to the 1850s. I can take you just back to the American South in the early 20th century. And if you had looked at Mississippi in 1960, oh. to think that in less than 15 years, there were go there was going to be black voting in that state and a civil right a federal civil rights act you would have thought i was bonkers so the question is how do you get from mississippi in 1960 to mississippi in 1967 or 1968 and this again comes back to my my view of history which is that you change the future by changing ideas and that points exactly to what people can do vote for sure uh, work for things you care about but talk, take up oxygen, uh, talk about things that are important to you. And, and don't just walk the other way when somebody says something that is outrageous, untrue. Um, I mean, Victor is great about this, speaking up and saying, hey, I like President Biden. I like what he's doing. I like that we have more jobs. I like that we have civil rights. I like these things. And people in this country, I think maybe since Watergate, Jill, I don't know, maybe it was even before that. Maybe it was maybe it was the U2 affair when Eisenhower had to admit he oh. lied to the American people. There is a sense that we're only supposed to complain about the government. We're never supposed to say it does stuff well. And the mm -hmm. truth is that this administration, and maybe that goes back to the question about the media. They don't want to say, hey, this is going well. Yeah. But right. this administration right. has done a lot of stuff really well that's made a lot of lives a lot better. And it's worth saying so. Taking up oxygen matters because politicians do hear that. Look how the Republican Party has backed off on its attacks on abortion rights since the American people started speaking up and saying, wait a minute, you know, I, I I needed an abortion because I was septic, you know, or whatever whatever they have said and put in the media. And taking up oxygen like that is how you turn the ship of state to a new place. And that if you can't do anything else, speaking up and talking about what you care about is not a small thing. It's also a reason why everyone listening should be reading your book. We are thrilled that you were able to join us today. And what's your official publication date? 
September 26th. It's coming coming right down the pipe. Coming soon. It'll be out there. Go hold um, up the book one more one more time. Uh, oh, put it down back. It's the pre-publication version, but yes, the this is. Cover, it, but it, the cover is the same, is the same so yes. it should it should work. And um, I I look forward to talking to you again sometime. It was a pleasure. It's always a pleasure, and I have not been able to do it much because um, Victor's been great about asking, but because I was writing a book and the letters every night, and there just was not time to breathe. Right. But now that the book is done, anytime you just excellent. Oh, thank you so much. Sure. And best of luck with the book tour. I know that's probably a marathon in itself. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be busy. It's gonna be yes, busy. yes. Country thank you both five. so much. It's always thank you. a joy. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much for watching or listening to this episode of iGen Politics with Heather Cox Richardson. We hope you found it as fascinating as we did, and we will uh, that you will come back next week for another episode of iGen Politics. In the meantime, you can subscribe to us on YouTube or wherever you follow your podcasts, and be sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. Thank you again, and we will see you next week. Thanks for being here.